Yeah, <laughs> it's about the same. So we were talking about um, different types of bonds we talked, or different types of bonding interactions, right? We Same had, bond. yep, sigma, pi, what else do we have? Delta. Yeah, delta. How did these all differ? How they overlap? Yep, the regions of overlap. So how many does sigma have? One. One, pi? Two. Yep, what about delta? Three. Four, I know. You think it's always going to be in sequential order? It never ends up working out that way. Is it one that even overlaps three? What's that? skip so much. Oh, three? Yeah. I, I'm actually kind of glad because, I don't know, do you guys have numbers you hate? <laughs> three? You hate three? I, no, I dislike three, but I really hate, hate the number, number. 47. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. Every time it comes up, I get irrationally mad that I see it, whatever I'm working on. I don't know why. It's just one of those things. It's a prime number. Yeah, so. Yep. Yeah, it's just so it's prime. It's, it's, it's prime. It's odd. It's in the middle of 40 is our crappy number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah age-wise, right? <laughs> It's all just going downhill. You're not, you're not old enough to just give up on life, but you're not. <laughs> not young enough to be able to enjoy most of what you have. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't want to just like that. I know. It's super hot. What, I don't know what the hell the weather is. You just snow in like three days probably. Yep. It's meant to jump up to like 70 degrees. Well, I think it is 70 degrees today. It's going to hop down. So, do you guys remember much about the rules for atomic orbitals? Like anything from Gen Chem at the ball? When you have Yeah, even anything like that. Like how they fill what like what we went back and we talked about what molecular orbitals actually were, right? Can anyone describe for me what a molecular orbital is? A linear combination of atomic orbitals. Yep, exactly. Okay, so what does that mean? So, in human speak, not PCAM speak. <laughs> <laughs> so if we if we're talking about like it's, yeah, it's a combination of your wave function. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you're not helping too much. No, it's basically the overlap of those atomic orbitals, right? Those atomic orbitals overlap. They make new molecular orbitals. Okay. So let's talk about some of the rules to figure out like the different energies, what atomic orbitals are going to overlap, and then you guys looked at molecular orbital diagrams when you were in Gen Chem, I'm sure of it, but they were probably really simple ones. We're going to return to the simple stuff, and then we're going to go to the more complex, because pretty much every, all the weird bonding that we saw can be explained with molecular orbital theory. Lewis structures are going to break down at this point, and really what we're going to focus on is molecular orbitals. And like in, in a PCAM lab where you'll go to draw stuff and you'll have like an atom here and an atom here and you know there should be a bond there. And I was like, don't worry about if the program's not drawing it. It's because the bonds are really just a conceptual thing. Like we do draw, we draw that line and we think there's a lot of meaning to it. And it's really us having way too much connection to that line. So we're going to talk about what really, like, what does bonding actually mean with this too. So this is a very important chapter. If you don't understand it, come talk to me, okay? So let's talk about the rules first, then we'll go through and we'll build some molecular orbital diagrams. So the rules. The number of atomic orbitals is equal to the number of molecular orbitals. So we're going to shorten atomic orbitals to AOs, molecular orbitals to NOs. So what does that mean? If we have um, let's say we have a hydrogen, or a hydrogen molecule. And for hydrogen number one, we'll call this hydrogen number two. Okay, they each have an electron in it, so we got this from chapter two. Now, these atomic orbitals, they're going to get close to one another, and they're going to overlap. 
How many molecular orbitals are going to be the result? Two. Two. How many atomic orbitals do we have? Two. Two. So you need to make sure that the atomic orbitals equals the number of molecular orbitals. The way that this is going to look, we'll explain this in a second on what's happening here. But these are the MOs. So these are for these two. Okay. Uh, do you remember bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, or did you ever talk about those? When it has to could you describe them to me? If not, that's okay. What A bonding orbital, when you populate a bonding orbital, orbital, you're increasing the bond strength. The other thing is, is bonding orbitals are lower in energy than the constructing AOs. So which one of these is the bonding orbital? Is it this one, the top one, or the bottom? At the bottom one, it's lower in energy, it's more energetically favorable for it. So two, bonding MOs are lower in energy than AOs used in the construction. considered to be in phase with one another. What that means is, is the wave functions have the same sign and they result in constructive overlap, which means we end up building a um, in phase standing group. These are in phase with one another. Okay, what do you think the next rule is going to be about? Anti-bonding. Yeah, anti orbitals. Yep, exactly. So anti-bonding. Yeah, just the opposite. So anti-bonding MOs are higher in energy. And the atomic orbitals used in the construction. Uh, those are out of phase with one another. What does that mean about their wave functions? This opposite sign. Yep, they're opposite signs, so when the waves hit one another, what type of interference do they have? Destructive. Destructive. So then there's nothing, there's no region of electron that's here. Yeah. So blah, 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 anti-bonding are higher than MOs. These are out of phase. We are missing one more type of orbital. One more animal. What's the other one? We have bonding, anti bonding. What else do you think we could have? Sort of bonding. Sort of bonding. Yeah, we're sort of bonding. We're going to include those in the bonding MOs, though. So these two are the result of chemical bonds, right? What about something like this? So N2, what else is on there besides bonds? Lone pairs. Lone pairs. Or what's another way you call lone pairs? Unbonded electrons. Yeah, non-bonded electrons. So we have bonding, anti-bonding, non-bonding. Non Non-bonding MOs are the same energy as its constructive atomic orbitals. So um, non-bonding MOs are the same in energy just gonna leave off half the word there. They're close to or exactly the same energy as the atomic orbitals. Okay, 
One more thing we have to talk about which orbitals are going to overlap. With H2, it's pretty simple because we only have two atomic orbitals. But when we go to more complicated systems, we have to think about a couple of things. What are some things that you think we have to consider when looking at atomic orbitals overlapping with one another? Or think back to PCHEM when we were talking about the Diels Alder experiment and we drew out those orbitals. When we were talking about like homos and lumos interacting with one another, what had to be the same in them? The orientation. Orientation is important. Yep, so orbital orientation. Um, what else? Their energies. Energies are a big one too. So AOs have similar energies. specific than orientation. No. Okay. <laughs> um, geometry? It's yeah, geometries are in there. Spin? No, I mean, spin's always important, but not. Nah, like this. Very... Well, what did we spend the entire last chapter going on about, essentially? Symmetry. It's all about, so it's about the symmetry. For orbitals to overlap, they have to have the exact same symmetry. If they don't, they're not going to overlap. So, um, six AOs of the same symmetry. kind of similar to um, what we were do a rule with electron configurations. It has to deal with orbital filling. What do you think the rule is? Orbital filling? Yep, so how do the MOs fill? The lowest. Yep. You go with the lowest in energy and then go up from there. So kind of following Hahn's rule uh, and the alpha principle. Lowest in energy, MOs fill first. Okay, so we're going to start with a simple system. We're going to start with H2, and then we're going to move on to more complex systems. You guys probably dealt with diatomic molecules. We're going to go up to systems where we have many molecules, excuse me, many atoms in there. So let's go back to H2. We have a pretty good diagram almost built, but I'm going to erase this stuff and do it again. So H2 is the simplest molecule we can have, for the most part. I'm sure someone's got some sort of argument out there to say why that's not it. That's for grad school. <laughs> H2. We know how many AOs do we have? Two. Yep. Number of AOs is equal to two. That's going to be equal to the number of atoms. What type of AOs are we dealing with? S. Yep. So we got two 1S orbitals. So let's write out the wave functions of these things. Let's say H2 and 1, and this is the first atomic orbital. We're also going to have a second atomic orbital, right? Just because of this rule here, so we need H2, comma 2. Let's look at what we get. For all wave functions, what do you always have out in front of them? 
Yeah, normalization constant. So if this has two atomic orbitals in it, and they're of equal sign, that's going to be our normalization constant. Okay. So now let's see what um, what we get out of here. Yeah, one. We're going to call this the one s of hydrogen a. A, and then we're going to have psi, or that's not psi. Five. Not phi? Yeah, phi. Yeah. And that's of our second, um, our second atomic orbital. Okay, so there are two combinations we can have, right? Yep. Plus. And minus. Which of these is the bonding orbital and which of these is the anti bonding orbital? Yep. This is a bonding orbital. How do you know that, James? Because they're constructed. Yep. Same sign. This is the anti bonding orbital. So it's an anti bonding contribution. All right, so let's draw, let's draw these and see what they actually look like. The neat thing is, is later on this week, tomorrow, we're going to actually look at some orbitals in some cases. So we got psi of 1, H2, sorry, H2, uh, 1. Let's show, show what happens before the atomic orbitals overlap and become the molecular orbital. So this is the center, <laughs> center of each hydrogen. What type of function do I need to draw around each of those? Circle. Yep, circle. Or if we want to get fancy, we can do it in 3D. I'm uh, not fancy. We have something like that. <laughs> not too interesting, right? OK, uh, I am drawing it like this, but in reality, these extend out really far in the space. It's just people tend to draw them. So that way you don't get, like when you start including many atoms, it doesn't get super messy. So know um, that even though I draw them this way, they actually extend out much further. Okay, so those two are gonna add together, and what's the resulting MO gonna look like? So here are those same points again. What's it gonna look like in there? Yeah, kinda like an oval. I like that. It should be as symmetrical as possible if you can do a better one than me. Awesome. It's like those, have you ever seen those weird people that can do like, like on a chalkboard, they can draw like a perfect circle by like, yeah, it's like they have competitions for it. <laughs> I don't know how you figure out you have that <laughs> skill or not. Yeah. Have you ever seen the dotted line where you just like have the chalk skip on the board? Mm -mm. James did it for like 20 years. Yeah. Was, so, was that like in analytical lab we were in for something we were just in here? Like, draw it. But so what do you do? It's just like if you hold the chalk right, mm -hmm. then you can have it skip on the board so it makes a dotted line and then you just go. Oh, it. just going? Huh, I'll yeah. try that now. <laughs> okay, what about the second orbital though? Well, typically people like to draw these where you color one in to show that that has a negative sign. Since they have destructive interference, what does this orbital look like? Like two squishy semicircles? Yeah, they're going to kind of look like Like that. What do you notice about this one? They don't interact. They don't interact at all. There's a lot less air in the electrons. Can be. Exactly. We're, there's no electron density between these two atoms, right? Mm -hmm. What do you 
call that region where there's no electron density? Space. In space. It starts with an N. Yep, a node. So that's a node. Okay, so let's try to draw the molecular orbital diagram for this. And we're going to be um, not quite complete with some of these. We can get more specific in terms of their um, symmetries of the bonding and anti-bonding. We're going to save that for closer to the end. So what we need to do, we always need to indicate our energy access. Uh, the way that this typically goes is, is you have the constructing atomic orbitals and the, on the left and on the right, and then in the center you have the molecular orbital. So we have 1s, we have 1s, they should be the same energy because they're the same exact atom. So we have, let's call this one, yeah, just one each. And they each have one electron in there, we know that from our uh, electron configurations and plunking them out on, on the periodic table. Okay, these two are going to overlap. We get the bonding and anti-bonding. Which one's higher in energy? Bonding or anti-bonding? Anti yeah, anti-bonding is going to be higher in energy. And then the bonding is going to be lower in energy. Most of the time, the way that these are drawn in a book is, is if you look at the distance between uh, the atomic orbitals and like the energetic difference between these two, they look the same. It's actually incorrect. It's never that way. It's always this one gets bumped up a little bit more, and this one gets bumped up a little bit more too. This, depending on what theoretical method you choose though, you might get something else. Okay, so how many how many electrons does H two have? Two. Two. Where are they going to go? In the yep, in the body. Okay. Now let's consider the type of overlap that we have here. What type of overlap do we have between these S orbitals? We have sigma pi or delta. Six. Yep. So we got sigma and we got sigma. A lot of times we denote an anti-bonding orbital. Do you remember how that gets denoted? With star. Yeah. Star, so that's a star. So this is a sigma, and this is our sigma star. Some people like to number these. I know your book does. Um, I only tend to number them when things get really confusing. Okay, so let's talk about a couple things that go into this that we've left out. Uh, one is about the quality of overlap. So that's like if like what happens if these two go on top of one another more, or if they're further away? What happens to the resulting MO diagram? Or the resulting molecular orbitals? So quality of overlap. Approximately, what is the bond distance of 
hydrogen, like the hydrogen hydrogen bond distance in H2. You have to take a stab. One and a half extra. One and a half? A little bit, a bit over. You're about halfway over. About halfway. <laughs> All right. So it would just be one angstrom? So it's about one angstrom, 0 0.74. Depending on what temperature you are, it can change the time. So let's say we're going to have a system. We're going to set up um, a couple of them where we have, uh, we're going to look at the HH distance. We're going to call this one HA, this one HB, and we're going to space this one three angstroms apart. Then we're going to have two angstroms, then we're going to have one angstrom. What we're going to do, we have to show each of those. Should have given myself more space. <laughs> okay, those one S's, they should all be the same energy, so I'm going to read through that. Anyway, one S. One S. One S. One S. I did it again. What the hell is the matter? Which one is going to have the best quality of overlap? One. Yep, one extra. Because the atoms are closer to one another, they're going to have a more complete overlap. Okay, so what do you know about the bonding and antibonding then? Bonding is going to be low in energy. Yep. And antibody is going to be higher. Yep. Sigma, sigma star. Okay, which one is going to have the worst quality of overlap? Three yep, three angstroms. That one, you're not going to have a ton of splitting between these orbitals or a ton of overlap. Sigma, sigma star. And then the one at two angstroms, it's going to be kind of like at an intermediate, right? So we got to get somewhere in between. Sigma, sigma star. So as you squish your atomic orbitals closer, the antibonding is going to raise the energy, the bonding is going to lower the energy. And that tends to make, so which of these has the strongest bond then? Yep, the one angstrom one does have a stronger bond. One, because the overlap's better. The, you get a better net energy gain this way by decreasing the energy of that body. There comes a certain point where you can squish these two together. So like if I keep pushing these even closer together, why does it stick at one angstrom? If I kept squishing those atomic orbitals over, wouldn't I get a really low bonding and a really high antibonding? Yep, you have some of that, you have exchange interactions happening. What else happens as we begin to push those two atoms close to one another? We just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. What starts to overlap at a certain point? Yeah, the nuclei, and that's really energetically unfavorable, right? So you kind of find a happy point. This is really only considering the electrons, so you don't think about like that happy point, but you have to consider that. Okay, um, so let's talk about the orbital symmetry that results from here. So MOs are labeled by their symmetry. We're going to go into more complicated symmetries. We're going to start with simple ones and then move to the harder stuff eventually. So symmetry labels. So MOs are labeled. So with this qualitative picture that we're drawing right now, we're going to go with a simple method. 
we're going to use subscripts G and U. You remember what those were for again? Yep, in German, right? So this is the German word. Even Gerard and Un Gerard. That's why I've heard it said. I don't know. My advisor would probably be screaming her head off at me. So she was Polish. She immigrated as a refugee over to um, to Canada. She lived in Calgary. So at the age of five, she didn't speak any any um, English at all. She only spoke Polish. After that, she went over to Germany to do her PhD, learned German in that meantime, and she also knew French. And then she came back here, worked under Roald Hoffman, who won the Nobel Prize for the Hoffman Woodwork Rules, like we were talking about in, um, in uh, PCHEM, where he came up with those symmetry arguments. And now she her children speak all sorts of weird, like they speak German, they speak Polish. It's funny to listen to them. They coo, like, and then so she'll, she'll coo at her children in Polish. Her husband doesn't know Polish at all. He's a big German guy. They talk to one another in German. She can understand everybody, but you can only understand a little bit of them. So it's like your own little secret language. I can barely speak English as it is, so I speak bad English. That's about it. Okay, so what are these, if you think back to um, the symmetry operations, and when we were talking about irreducible representations, what did the G and U have to deal with? Which operation? A and B. What's that? A and B. Th there are A and B ones, but that wasn't it. That had to do with the principal axis, and if it was um, symmetric or asymmetric. The U and Gs had to deal with Another symmetry operation. Sigma H. Nope, not sigma H. It's inversion. It's inversion. Yep, it's an inversion axis. So, symmetric or asymmetric with respect to inversion? Symmetric. Yep. So I symmetry I and then asymmetric asymmetry. Okay, so we're going to redraw this MO diagram for the 20th time. We're going to give ourselves a little more space. So back to H2. I promise you we will do something other than H2 today. We just got to get there. What was that? <laughs> oh, this is the cool stuff. The first time I saw this sort of stuff, I didn't get a lick of any of it. Um, it wasn't until I sat around just thinking about it and actually read something by Roald Hoffman that I'm going to give to you guys when I was in graduate school that just was like, Whoa, it all makes total sense. Why didn't they explain it that way? I don't know why they didn't explain it that way. <laughs> okay, so we have the sigma and we have the sigma star. Now we have to try and figure out what are the symmetry labels that we're going to give each of these. For this first one, if we were to draw the orbitals, Get that right, and then for this one, we have that. So, is this going to be a U or a G? G. G. Yep, it's symmetrical. Good. U or a G? U. Yep. So that helps us differentiate to um, what type of orbital overlap we're looking at. Now, this isn't to say that all U's are anti-bonding and all G's are bonding. It just helps you figure out what does the symmetry look like. OK? 
okay? You really have to draw out the orbitals and check it out and see for yourself for which label they get. Do these things make sense to you guys or not really? Yeah? yeah? Okay. We're going to see that a lot more when it comes to the solid state structured stuff, so if you're confused, let's talk about it. Okay, so we have those. Now, how do we talk about bond strength when it comes to molecular orbital diagrams? Do you remember how you did it in GenChem? You probably did a calculation associated with it. Did you ever talk about bond order? <laughs> Probably it's been like what? I think I needed to know it for the OIT. Oh, did you? I think so. Huh. It's kind of mean. It's kind of mean of you guys. I've been about three years. Mm -hmm. Three years out. We talked like how long you've been sober. It's been about three years. I got a shit. I haven't had to talk about MO theory in that. <laughs> so what this is? It's it's a way to measure bond strength. The higher the bond order, the higher the bond strength. What are, so instead of thinking of, okay, there's a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, the actual way that you can gauge this, especially when we get to transition metal complexes, is, is based upon the bond order. So a measure of bond strength. isn't completely void of the Lewis structure, though. It can be thought it's related to the number of bonds in the Lewis structure. Um, for ones that works out well, it works out great. For other ones, you get some weird stuff like a bond order of 1.25. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it means you're somewhere, you're a bit stronger than a conventional, like, um, conventional pure covalent single bond but you're not quite at a pure covalent double bond. <laughs> Some kids have a great day out there. Is that, is that like the resonance concept? Yes. Okay. And that's why we have to draw those things because Lewis structures don't work out, but MO theory works perfect for it. So it's actually, MO theory is a way better descriptor of every type of bonding you're gonna see in the system. Okay, okay so it's related. To the number of bonds in Lewis structures actually that was meant to say resonance resonance Lewis structures. And the way that it's calculated, the bond order is equal to one half times number of electrons in bonding orbitals, bonding MOs, minus number of electrons in, what do you think it's going to be? Antons. And that's why you don't see non-bonding in here. They really don't influence the overall bond order. Okay, let's hop to our H2 example. Luckily, I didn't erase it this time, so we can keep it up there. Let's calculate the bond order for this one. So bond order of H2, one half. How many electrons in the bonding orbitals? Two. Two minus number in antibonding? Zero. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to get two over two, one. You draw the Lewis structure for this guy. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Single bond. Now the interesting thing, if you were curious about like what is the bond order for a bunch of other stuff, all the calculations that you guys are running in PCHEM, if you scroll through the output in games, it'll actually tell you the bond order of every single interaction in there. So you can gauge the bond strength that way. Okay, let's look at a more complicated example. We're going to jump to diatomic molecules. First one we're going to consider is N2. So 
homonuclear diatomic Okay, so what does homonuclear mean? You have the same nucleus, so we're going to talk about an element that has the same atoms comprising it, and only two, two of these atoms. Let's build one for N2. So we're going to build a molecular orbital diagram for N2. Consider N2. If you have colored pencils or pens, this is kind of a good time to use them. You're going to want to leave a lot of space. I would suggest to go to another page to do this. I'm going to try my best to, to squeeze it all in, but sometimes it doesn't work well. OK, so we're going to have, we have two, two ends along here. So we have N, N2 is going to go here, and we have another one. If we think back to the electron configuration for nitrogen, what's it going to be? side because we have the exact same atom. I drew those two P's probably too close. Okay, the S orbital. Let's actually let's fill in uh, our electron count. So we got symmetry, they're also close to one another in energy. Before we do that though, how many atomic orbitals do we have? Yeah, we have 10. So how many molecular orbitals should we have? Well, how do we get 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah. Same thing for the other side. So how many MO should we have? Should have it. <laughs> it's not as bad as you think. Okay, these two are going to overlap, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, what type of interaction is that going to be between the S orbitals? Yep, that's going to be a sigma type interaction. We're going to label that. How do you label it? Oh, okay, just left in the sigma. We'll call that. Um, one sigma, this guy, two sigma. The numbers are just a way to describe where you are or what orbital we're talking about. Okay, um, what's going to be the, what did I forget on this part? Star. Star, what else did I forget? Electrons, yep, so electrons got to go whoop, whoop. Yep, G and U. Which one's going to be G? Which one's going to be U? G on the bottom. Yep, this one? U. Yep. Okay, then we're going to have our 2S here. Is that going to overlap with any of these other ones? 2S overlapping with. Can't 2P? 
So you're saying these these guys are going to overlap? Which one is more? What is the one that is most likely to overlap with this 2s? The other 2s. The other 2s. Because it's same symmetry, same energy, right? So what type? So we're going to get a bonding and an anti-bonding out of this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's label this one, let's call this one, what type of overlap is it going to be? Sigma. Yep, it's going to be a sigma. Um, same for the top one, sigma star. We'll just label it three and four. And then what is going to be the symmetry label for this one? G and the bottom. Yep, G, top one. Okay, now let's fill in electrons. We should really wait to the very end to do this, but that's okay. Okay. Next, we have to deal with the p orbitals. And we have to consider all the different types of overlap that they can have. Before we go any further, let's try to draw some of these. What are the possible n sub, uh, n, n sub L values for the 2p? Negative 2. No, not negative 2. two oh, uh, n sub L? Yep, n sub L. What did you say, Alex? You're mouthing. Negative 1, 0, and 1. Remember, the L value is equal to 1 for this guy. So we have that. That means that there are three different orientations. What are those three different orientations? Yep, x, y, z. So let's, let's just draw a coordinate system. We're going to say that this is uh, let's say z, x, and then we'll have y going into the board. So let's consider those are the centers of the nitrogen atoms. OK. We can have a P Z interaction, right? So this is a P Z. That's a P Z. We're forgetting a sign right now, though, right? Do you want to draw the bonding one or the anti bonding one? Okay, let's draw the bonding one. If we if that's a negative value there, where should, which lobe should I color with a negative sign? The top one or the bottom one? Bottom. Yeah, the bottom one. And they're going to have constructive overlap, so that's a bonding type of reaction. Now, what type of overlap do we have? Or how many regions of overlap do we have? Two. Two, yep, yeah, got it. There, and again, even though these are drawn small, they really spread out in the space. We're just doing this for neatness sake. And then we have this one. So what type of overlap is this? Pi. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a pi over there. Jeez, that's good. <laughs> what about if these are out of phase with one another? We're still going to have what type of overlap? So that was a bonding interaction, right? This is a pi star interaction. We'll draw a better diagram a little bit. Okay, so that's for the PZ. Uh, let's look at the PX. So it looks like that. Sorry, X. Okay, if I color that one in, should this one be colored in or the left one? The left one. Yeah, what type of interaction is this? Sigma. Yep, it's a sigma type of interaction. And then we could draw the other one. That where 
they're out of phase with one another. What type of bonding interaction is this? Sigma star. Sigma star. Yep, that's an anti-bonding. There we go. Okay. But I'm forgetting one more set of orbitals. Yep. Those are going to be the same as one of these. Which one is it going to be the same as? Yep. We think about it, the y's are coming out of the board, right? So if we just rotated this diagram that way, it's going to be the same thing. So could be that or or p y. Same thing. So how many sigma bonding interactions are we going to have? Oh, one. one. How many pi bonding interactions are we going to have? Two. two. So we're going to have two of those energy ones. What about pi star? Two. two. Yep. What about sigma star? One. one. Okay. Now we have to figure out, we have to reconsider the quality of overlap. Which of these has the best quality of overlap? Px. Yep. The Px is going to have the best quality of overlap. So that means if we're considering these bonding interactions, which one's lower in energy? Yes. Yep, the sigma interaction is. So let's draw that out. Uh, we got a blue here. Why is it like that? Is it always like that? Is sigma always just better than pi? No. Sometimes it just has to deal with the quality of overlap. The irritating thing about all of these is most, I'm going to say most of the time, yes, that's true. But there's always cases where it isn't. Right, right. What one should really do is, is go through with a cal like a then like a calculation like we're doing in been doing in PCHEM mm -hmm. and see what that looks like. That's the only way you actually know these things. So yeah, we're gonna get one sigma, and then how many energy levels should I draw for the pi? Three. One more time? Two. Oh, Two. Two. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so now we have five sigma. Oh.